I just want to say I'm, I'm going to give you some ideas about this idea of understanding the public and the news media and all that. But I do want to say that if it, what we're talking about doesn't make sense to you, let's say intellectually or professionally or culturally or personally, I mean like no problem, right? It's totally up to you. But if what, what I am saying does make sense, I would really encourage you to try it. That's all. And just keep an open mind and let's see, maybe something might be useful for you, I hope so. So maybe what we could do is start by asking a question, sort of getting my stuff arranged here, it's very important for me to be exactly correct on that. Here's a question. What are your problems with, uh, with how the news media covers science? Just a few words maybe, and I'll, I'll do it in a very low-tech way and just do it like this. But just give me a, give me a couple words. What are, what are your problems with how the news media, and by the way, let me say, I would, in, I would include in the news media how, how EMBO covers science in, in scientific journals. Why not? But I think I'm talking more about, let's say, the mass media rather than the specialized scientific media, but I, I wouldn't exclude it. Give me a problem. What? Very good, excellent. And I'm going to try this, sorry about this. Oversimplification. Okay, give me another one. Oh, that's good. Try it again, sorry. I know you can see my mistakes, I can't. There we go. Fication. Well, anyway, I can't spell. There we go. Give me another one. Sensational. Okay, that's good. That's a good one. Sensationalism. Yeah, that's good. What's another one? Okay, inventions over discovery. Give me another one. Anybody, it's okay. What do you hate the most? Science versus technology. Can you be more specific? No, because people misunderstand these words. Like, science Ah, yeah, that's interesting. So I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but we, would we say it's a little unclear, perhaps, or they're not being precise enough? Something like that? Okay, if, if you don't mind, maybe we can just say unclear. Or, let's say, im, im, sorry, I'm so bad. imprecise. Not, not exact, not being, not, being, not being strictly correct. Inaccurate. Okay, that's good. Okay, all right. Focus only on what sells. Yeah, what's useful. What's, and I will have to do that in quotes, what's useful, what's practical. Yeah, that's good. Just a couple more. Anything else? Beautiful. Creating expectations. Un should we add unrealistic expectations? Indeed. Indeed. Thank you for that clarification. That's extremely clear. Unrealistic expectations. Give me one more. Anything. Doesn't matter. Yeah, okay. Celebrity driven. Something like that? Yeah, okay, good. Thank you. It's very nice. It's beautiful. Gonna, God. All right, sorry, just kidding. Okay, love this. Con I want to continue. I think I'm, I'm going to continue. I don't care. Now, do scientists have problems expressing ideas to the public and the news media? Give me one. Anything. One. Need to simplify. Simplify. Okay. Give me another one. Other than that, there's no other problem. <laughs> yeah, I know. Just maybe there are just too many. Just pick one. What language? What about the language? Ah. 
yet difficult to express ideas so people understand. Is that fair enough? Okay, that's good. What's another one? What's another one? The need to express a practical application. What can we do with that? The need to express practical, when there may be no practical application. Is that what you're saying? When there is none, yes, yet. Okay, what else? What else? Anything? Nothing. I'll add one. Jargon. You know what I mean? That's as opposed to technical language. Technical language is precise. That's useful. Jargon is language that's used within closed societies like institutions, which has no meaning to anyone outside the institution. You know what I mean? That's not useful. In fact, that's useless. Anything else? Nothing else? Do scientists want to get published? Bernd, I think so. Yeah, they want to sell. So just as a comment, just really quick, let's see if we can do this. Again, my, my technical skills are limited. Let's copy this, put it here. Do this. Oh, God. Let's see, I oh, know, we'll do it a different way. I know this is embarrassing, but we'll try it, try it the best way we can. All right, let's check it out. Well, certainly I would say that, yeah, the news media can... Oops. Hmm. Um, is this one working? Let's try. Yeah, oversimplifying. Oh, interesting. Need to simplify. Uh, sensationalism. Oh, yeah, well, actually, we do want to sell. Uh, unclear, imprecise. Well, we're actually, it's very difficult to understand us. Uh, focus on only what's useful. Want to express the practical when there is nothing yet, okay? So you get what I'm talking about, right? The point is, is that Maybe there's more in common between those, two, between those two sides or those two groups than... Can I grab one of those? Is that, that's a good one, thanks. Excuse me. Thanks, sorry. Yeah, so the point is maybe we have a little more in common than we thought. That's the point. That actually we're, we are connected by our common humanity rather than our profession, possibly. If you want to call journalism a profession, that is, I'm not sure. But the point is, and I'm sure Barrett will agree, that journalists are not experts in science. Even his highly specialized editors are not experts in science, although it's, it's quite, with Barrett and scientific journals, let's say it goes farther. And by the way, the mass media journalists aren't either, and neither is the general public. Who is the expert in science? Who? Yeah, you. That's right. And the public and the news media expect you to be. They expect that. Nobody's going to help them if you don't. So to communicate effectively, and that's the, our theme today, it's, it's really essential that you express your ideas clearly, especially in terms that your audience understands. Now that sounds so obvious and so simple, but that's really the point. Here's a concept for you that failure to communicate is, okay, it's a little dogmatic, usually the fault of the communicator. So if you have a problem with your results, how much of that is your fault? I would like to ask. Now, my talk today is going to be on two levels. I'm going to talk about some theoretical things. And as an American, naturally, I'm against all things theoretical, right? But we do need a little bit of theory to underline, underlie our ideas. And then most of what I'm going to talk about, I hope, will be practical things that you might be able to use. Here's the first one. 
Let's say that science is obviously going through a very challenging period right now. Valid questions are being raised about the value of a lot of your work, especially the value of translational research over basic research, which may have incremental or even no results after many years of uh, testing, of, of funding. And the clear trend today is that funding for science is moving away from public money and more toward private funding sources. So scientists can no longer assume they will get funding simply because something interests them or, more to the point, provides them with job security. Just saying, because I am interested in this, it should be funded, gets less and less convincing every day. And Berndt's presentation showed us very well that as competition for these limited research funds increases, it is inevitable that projects that cannot be clearly explained in grant proposals, excuse me, that projects that can be clearly explained in grant proposals have an edge over those that cannot be. And that is already happening. Proposals that seek money for very limited goals or even for what some people might consider trivial research gets funding, while more complex projects don't simply because the former is easier to describe and uh, explain to donors. Now that does not mean that what you're doing is not valid, quite the opposite. What you're doing is valid. What it does mean is that you now have to be much more thoughtful in explaining why scarce resources should be diverted to your project instead of to someone else's. And obviously that is not easy because what you do is not like that. It's more like that and like that and like that and like that and like that. All right? So I agree, what you do is complicated. All right? Fine, I agree. And you might say there's no simple answer, you might say there's no answer. No answer at all. In fact, there won't be for many years, which is valid. So let's say to you, the process may look like this. Undiscovered lands, you know. On some days, maybe it looks like that, you know, road to nowhere, right? But maybe that's a bad day. But my comment to you is I think the public is thinking more like that. Push a button, get a result. And that is especially true when it comes to that, a highly emotional issue like cancer. So my view is that there's a big gap between your reality and the public's expectations. And my question is, how much of the, that gap is your fault? First, recognize, if you would bear with me, that most people don't know anything about what you do. Nothing. Very little. Or they're confused. I mean, in general, that's, I believe, because we're not communicating very well as members of the scientific community. Here's a question. I would challenge you to name 10 scientists who are known to the general public. How about 10 Italian scientists? And compare that with performers, with athletes, with business people, with bankers, with politicians, right? Now, why is that? I don't know. My own view is apparently scientific culture does not encourage that. I'm not sure if it's important or not, but maybe that's a worthwhile question to consider. And your challenge, and I think the source of a lot of your difficulties in this area, is that the general public doesn't know anything about what you really do and how you do it. They only know what their values, their culture, their friends and family, and the news media tells it. That's all they know because you don't communicate it so well. And also consider that a lot of times, you know, scientists don't even know the probabilities or risks themselves. And maybe they're not as forthcoming about that as they should be. At the very least, you know, scientists don't generally express themselves very clearly, and that leads to the biggest question of all. 
Ready? That's right. Because the public knows that science has given us miracles. No question. But science has also given us nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, environmental pollution, climate change. All right. So I would suggest it is not a given that people should automatically trust science. Why should people automatically trust scientists? Why? All right. Okay, now, here's the theoretical part. Sorry, and I don't mean to get into too much jargon, but I think it's useful to have a little bit of theory to underlie our discussion. Effective communication. Nice words. All right. Here's a tip for you. There's a word, and that's a word. Well, I've got news for you. Information is not communication. <laughs> communication is perception. It's about how the audience hears what you're saying. I'll give you an example of this. Um, I have to step away from the microphone for a minute. Uh, Johnny, that was a great dinner last night. I enjoyed the mussels. Johnny, could you hold that for me, please, just for a moment? Thank you. The second one was communication. Communication demands a result, an action. Information does not. And that's why we have this incredibly endless capacity for sports scores and celebrity news and, and you name it, recipes. Why? Because it demands nothing. It's totally trivial. So it's easy. But communication is hard. What it means is, it's not what you know, but how you express it that is decisive in whether your audience understands it. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that they believe you. That's a different issue altogether. It's just about whether they understand you or not. And that is very, very, very tricky, especially if you know a lot about your subject. Because there's something in human nature that says, if you know something, it's very hard to imagine other people not knowing that. <laughs> That's just the way it is. That's right. That's why so many experts and scientists have trouble communicating, or they don't communicate so well. So what's the solution? I have an idea for you. Expressing ideas, expressing ideas in terms of shared values has impact on audiences. Now shared values, this is again the kind of the jargonistic theoretical thing, but shared values um, are things that we all share as human beings. So let me ask, what is the number one shared value, would you say? These are things we all share as human beings, not just scientists or other professionals. What's the one, number one shared value? Well, I'll give it to you. I think the number one shared value is, I think it's fear of death. It's my number one, I would be, believe. I think that's reasonable. But shared values also include things like these, like hopes, dreams, stereotypes and preconceptions, disappointments, culture. You know, we all have these things as human beings. It doesn't matter what we do. Religion, all those things all those things. Now the idea is, is if you can frame your ideas in terms of the shared values of your audience, you have a better chance of getting them involved, engaging them. Because they think, oh, he understands me, she's talking to me. But the key concept is that different groups of people have different sets of shared values. For example, what are the shared values of the news media? Give me one. Hmm? Audience. Audience. Oh, beautiful. Thanks, Stefano. Health. 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 Yeah, that's good. But I like this one, audience. I'll just go ahead and go forward. Yeah, audience. They're very competitive for audience share. Here's another thing about the shared values specifically of the news media. They're very skeptical of government, business, and institutions. Do you know why that is, by the way? Experience. That's why. Yeah. 
Never trust a public relations person is a common attitude among producers and editors and reporters. News is both public service and big business, as I think Berndt will attest. And they are very aware of their audience. That's right. So they work to program to that audience. All right. What are the shared values of the general public? Here are a few ideas. Something that touches their lives directly. So it's not like the news media. They have a different priorities, different things that are important to them. Something new, unusual, breaks stereotypes. That's interesting for them. An unforgettable image, sound, or moment. Humanity and human emotion works for the general public. What are the shared values of donors? Donors to your projects. Well, these are a few of my ideas. Tell me what are your goals and targets? What am I paying for? <laughs> what result can I expect? What is, the, what, are the scope, what is the scope and what are the boundaries of your accounting? Again, very different. Here's a good one. What are the shared values of scientists and researchers, your colleagues? Well, these are my ideas. You can disagree, obviously. It's a free country. Competitive, humanistic, careerist, image reputation highly valued. Problem solving and innovation is important. Evidence over emotion, cautious, insular. Know what I mean by that? Stuck in a bubble? Yeah. And can be overwhelmed at work. So the idea is, is if you frame your complex idea in terms of the shared values of a target audience, it's very useful to help that audience understand what you're talking about. Again, whether they believe you or not is a completely different subject. So like this, take your idea and sort of build the shared values of your target audience around that. That's called proving relevance. Any questions? Okay. Yeah, Davida, go ahead. So you made a list of shared values among different categories of growth. Mm. I wonder whether over time values change. Oh yeah, that is the best thing. Obviously they do. And the list of shared values of people are very complicated, you know, they're very contradictory. Very, very contradictory. So of course that changes all the time. Absolutely. I don't know. It's a, it's a very philosophical question. I don't know. Let's do this at dinner. Yeah. I guess my, my only comment would be, because I do want to go on, but let's talk about this more. My only comment would be that it's important just to try to understand who you're trying to reach and understand what's important to them. Remember, shared values have nothing to do with you and everything to do with the person you're trying to talk to, trying to reach. So again, my only comment would be to just get to know them a little bit better. If you don't mind, though, David, I'd like to move on really quick, and I want to talk about moving now from the theoretic... Oh, Stefano, do you want... Okay. Okay. I want to move from, from the, uh, let's say, the theoretical and the abstract to more the practical and specific. So let's just say that uh, to express ideas clearly, you've got, uh, effectively, you've got to be clear, understandable, speak in a way audiences understand, which we talked about. Now, in the broadcast news media, that means expressing yourself clearly in something called a soundbite, which is about a 20-second short clip that's used, uh, that's taken out of an interview and used in a story. But sound bites are actually a very, very useful way of practicing expressing ideas clearly. It's a good way to find techniques to express ideas, complex ideas, in, a, in an effective way, I think. So what I've done is I've asked, with Johnny's help, to, I've asked four of our colleagues to work with us on this. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to give each of them a question about science. It's not a trick question or anything like that. 
and I'm going to ask them to just write down how they would respond, but I'd like to ask them to write it down. Um, actually, let me explain it. So uh, if you guys could get together, it's Davida, um, Stefano, Katarina, and Serena. Could you come and just sit right here in the front, please? Thank you. I know this is embarrassing. Thank you for your help. Sorry, the, uh, uh, the, so Stefan, sorry, the, this Stefano, not you, St Stefan, not you. No problem, <laughs> exactly. All right, so first of all, I need to know, do you have, does everybody have something to write with and a pen and a piece of paper? Okay, need some paper too. Thank you. Now I'm gonna give each of you guys one question and please don't think too hard about it or don't struggle over it, but I would like you to write down your answer. You don't need to spontaneously say it, but what I'd like is, is I'd like your answer to be no more than a couple of sentences, please, okay? Or three, three sentences is okay, but let's not write a speech, okay? And each of you will get one question and uh, just again, write down your answer, take your time. So I'm gonna give each of you your question, are you ready? Okay, Stefano, you're first. Here's your question. Okay, again, just to remind you, this is what it is. And I'm actually gonna ask your colleagues to read your answers. By the way, what this is about is just simply to identify patterns of what works and what doesn't. Are there ways to, to see if we can identify components of effective, expressing ideas effectively? Let's find out. Stefan, that, uh, sorry, yeah, Stefan, that's your first question, please, Stefano. Go ahead. Why should anyone fund what you do? So you can go ahead and write that down, you got it? If you, could, you can want to write down the question, you can, maybe it's more useful. Again, very basic fundamental question, not a trick question, nothing like that. Why should anyone fund what you do? Okay, Serena, you, have you got it, Stefano? Okay, yes. thank you. Serena, here's yours. What is the relevance of what you do for the general public? Tavida, I know. And Serena, are you ready? Can I move on to the next one? Thank you. Okay, Davida, why should anyone trust science and scientists? Okay. And Katharina, here's yours. Ready, Davida? It's okay? Thank you. Katharina, you've got an interesting one. Are there any limits ethically to what scientists can do, especially when it involves something that would not occur in nature? So just take a few minutes and write down, again, don't, please don't think too hard about it, but I need it expressed in two or three sentences at the most. Then let me know when you're ready. Let us know when you're ready. So, Eric. Maro. After Bern has taught us that we cannot even change brightness and contrast. Hmm and be very fair with other submissions that are now teaching us on how to trick journals and media and donors. Mm. Actually, I don't like the word trick, but I think the media, the journalists and donors, they need to hear you. Remember that this <laughs> is not that. It's a completely different medium and it has different requirements. This, right there, stay right there, Marina. This is not this, right? So, thank you, Marina. So, so the idea is, is that different mediums require different methods, completely different approaches, just like when we're working with different people. That's my answer, anyway. Different mediums are different. Stefano? Ten scientists that are known, mm. known by the general public. And that would be the ten scientists that are known by the general public. You would know, I mean. The average age is 85. Well, I'm sorry? The average age is 85. <laughs> so, so the point is uh, not that the scientists that are not the general public, the scientists that are not doing science, and active science. Okay, fair enough. And so. What? <laughs> I don't know the situation in Italy, but uh, it's just for you to think about. But it, again, it seems like there's an imbalance there somehow. 
to me. Anyway, everybody finished? Finished? Serena? No, not yet. I can tell you, this, by the way, in the States it's the same. It's exactly the same in the States. Absolutely. And Italy's a celebrity-driven culture somewhat, same as the States. It's the same in the States. All right, ready, you guys? Don't mean to put you too, under too much pressure. So would you like to start, Katerina? Yes. Okay, so if you could give her the microphone, and what we want to do now, uh, actually, wait one second. I want to make sure everybody's done, because Davida, are you finished? Okay, Katerina, wait one second. Serena, are you finished? Almost. Stefano, you're finished, I think, yeah? Okay, Stefano, let's start with your question first. I'm going to go back, back uh, there to that. And would you please hand it to Serena and have Serena read it, please? I'll read the question. The question is, why should anyone fund what you do? Because our work may advance understanding of embryonic development, disease, and reveal means to tackle cancer and improve patients. Okay. Patient All right. How was that? Did you like it? Let's put it another way. What did you remember? What words did you remember? What? Patient survival. Patient survival. What else? That cancer. Patient survival. That's interesting, isn't it? How, anything else? What? Embryonic development. Very good. Anything else? It's interesting that what, was, that what most people said, just as a very random thing, was patient survival and cancer. How many people in this room were patients or know a patient? All. All. Shared value. That's a shared value. Cancer. What's that figure? One in three? Right? As everyone knows, one in three of us will be touched by cancer at some time in our lives. Shared value. That's why it works. It's very good. Okay, uh, Serena, hand yours to Davida, please, and we'll see the uh, question again. The question is, what is the relevance of what you do for the general public? You read hers, please. Um, I'm trying to find novel therapies for common diseases, such as myocardial infarction, neurodegeneration, diabetes, for which current medicine cannot do much. And I want to understand how the human body can get sick in order to cure it better. What do you remember? Human body. And maybe not just the words, although the human body is good, Valerio. Not just the words. What? I'm trying. I'm trying. Anything else? Yeah, exactly. I'm trying. Anything else? Do it, do it better. Cure it better. I'm trying to cure it better. What is that? That is passion. Compassion. Enthusiasm. Commitment, involvement, etc. It's nice. Okay. Davida, hand yours to Katerina. Oh, hang on. Let me just change the question. Why should anyone trust science and scientists? I love this one. Because they produce new knowledge. <laughs> it's extremely brief. Because they produce new knowledge. Well, I think it's easy to ask what we can remember. Was it, was it short? Ah, but was it general or specific? General or specific? Very general. We produce new knowledge about what? About cancer, heart disease, diabetes, whatever. Whatever it is. My comment is, is that generalities work less well than specifics. The more specific it is, the stronger it'll be, the more persuasive. Specifics work. Okay, very good. And Katerina, give yours to Stefano, please. 
Are there any limits ethically to what scientists can do, especially when it involves something that would not occur in nature? There should be some limits, but there are, they are, I think, difficult to define. And in my opinion, these limits should be decided by a panel of people made mostly, but not exclusively, by scientists. What do you remember? Difficult to define. What else? Now this one, again, this, by the way, this is not about anybody's work, and that is a tricky question. It's not a trick question, it's a difficult one. This is a common preconception I think a lot of people have about science. They're just screwing around those people. They're freelancing. That's what the whole debate in Europe over genetic, you know, GM food is all about. They're just, they don't really know. So in my view, this is the kind of question where you've got to have a much stronger answer and nothing about our group. Actually, it's not just scientists. Civil society has a place in this as well, right? Actually, yes, we feel very strongly about ethical limits, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Just as a comment, I don't mean to hector you, but that's a really tough one and a really, that's one I think that we really need to think about in biological science. All right, first of all, thanks to our group. And some ideas about this. To express ideas effectively when you're asked a reasonable question, those, none of those are unreasonable questions, results help. Specifics are better than generalities or platitudes. Be specific. Compassion works. Concern works. I don't mean emotionalism, but showing you're also human works. It's persuasive. I care. Connect with the audience of shared values as we discussed, and that's it, uh, Maro, is every audience has specific shared values and the medium is always different as well, whether it's television or personal. Human cost, human emotion means how others are suffering, not you. Connect with that, I will alleviate suffering. Passion and enthusiasm, I, I support that. And jargon free, conversational, meaning more or less how people speak, and most of these we heard fit that one. Okay, thank you very much. You can stay there or move back to your place if you want. I just want to talk a little bit now about co conveying expertise and how to do that. If you want to convey your expertise effectively, and I love the comment for Berndt, Berndt, isn't there too much science out there now already? If you want to convey your expertise effectively, do this. Think in advance what you want to say, and here I think is a key. Think hard about what interests you personally. And I don't mean, you know, I mean personally, professionally. Even if it's like the most minor thing, it seems minor. Don't, don't get involved in your preconceptions or anything. If it interests you, it's interesting, and I will guarantee you it will interest an audience. I guarantee you. Try it. Ask yourself, what, why did it, what, what interested me about that thing? Oh. Context is obviously important. A common perception, I think, is, you know, God made these things. The public doesn't know the tangerines and Dalmatians and corn on the cob and cats and, you know, the things we get at the natural food stores are all genetically modified or some form of breeding. You know, the public just doesn't get that. They think God made those things. And even if you think that's totally obvious. So my comment is you should challenge what you think is obvious. Remember what we said at the beginning, if you know something, it's hard to imagine others not knowing it. So really challenge what you think is obvious. That's why our, our discussion today, frankly, is extremely obvious. <laughs> challenge that. This is a nice technique in talks, I think. Describe parenthetically, GFP, oh yeah, that's a dye that turns cells green. That's very useful. That's very useful in talks. It gives people a break. These work obviously very well. Analogies and comparisons from ordinary human life. Again, these are tips for you, that's all. Come up with your own, these are my dumb little ones. I like, like a teenager's bedroom, that's my favorite one. But come up with your own, but take it from real life. And by the way, an effective comparison is comparing something very known with something completely unknown. 
That's very effective. That helps people understand. Fulfill preconceptions about science. Again, because people don't know what they do. They think there's like this genius guy. His name is Stefano, right? He wears like a white lab, lab coat and he's there at night and like there's a eureka moment and that's what happens, right? When we know that's the opposite, except that Stefano is a genius, you know, except for that part. So the idea is, is to when you're expressing ideas to people outside the scientific community, fulfill their preconceptions of who you are. We didn't know what we would find. We didn't know what we would expect. Here's what we thought we knew and here's what amazed us. And remember, the result of most research isn't it that you start at one point and you end like 180 degrees out anyway, right? In fact, that's the joy of it is the, what you didn't expect. Yeah, so that, that, that's a good technique. This is another good one I like. Um, I got this from Dr. Daniel Paper at the NKI up in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And um, the idea is to express ideas visually in your presentations and also in your thinking, which is a very useful way of expressing ideas for these complex topics. For example, this is from uh, my friend Dr. Paper. How would you visually explain the transition from this, that's a normal mole, to this, which is an abnormal mole? Well, his idea was this. Yeah, right. Now, as he explained it to me, you, you guys have to know, I, I'm not an expert, but this was his explanation. He says that every mole actually has the potential to become a malignant melanoma, but most never do because that's because a mole is like a race car with both the accelerator and the brakes on full all the time. But when the brakes come off, the accelerator takes over, and that is the beginning of malignancy. Now, I rather like that. Um, and let's just say that thinking in pictures can put you off balance, and I would say that's very good. I would say that's quite good. It's a different way of expressing your ideas. And it challenges you to rethink, to be more creative, I think. So just as a suggestion, just try it. That one you can take or leave, but here's one I insist on. Create a simple presentation. Designed for audiences who don't know who you are, what you do, or how you do it. Minimize the slides and don't do it from an existing presentation. That never works. <laughs> it never works, right, Johnny, we know. It never works. Do it as about a 20 minute talk maximum and leave a lot of time for questions and answers. And then as far as you are comfortable, do it, express your passion and your humanity, why you got in to do this, why, why you're doing this. And you know, we have these science and society uh, uh, initiatives, EMBO is a big part of that. I totally support that, obviously. That's why I'm here today. And it's not for inside the insular scientific community, it's for everybody else in the world. I really recommend this. Okay, now, now we're gonna go really far afield from science and we're gonna talk about this word. As I mentioned earlier, um, it's enough to express your ideas so people understand them, but how do you, uh, a much tougher problem is persuading people, bringing them around to your point of view, particularly people who may not be interested or actually may, may totally oppose your ideas, you know. Yeah, that's right. So how does that work? I'm not gonna tell you how to do it because I don't know, but. Let's see if we can find some of the characteristics of what is persuasive. First of all, who is persuasive? Just pick someone. Who's persuasive? Hmm? Okay, like that guy maybe. He will, in his prime, I think, very much so. Here's another one. Also reasonably persuasive. May have faded a bit, but I think he's still going well. Know who that is? Very persuasive guy moral authority and much more. You know who that is? Mrs. Buto. Also very persuasive. That picture by the day was by the way was taken the day she was murdered. So let's just say that the ability to persuade is not some like mysterious kind of power or like personal magnetism, you know, that can attract or influence or seduce or whatever you think it is, you know. I don't believe in that. I, don't, I think that's, that, is, that just doesn't fit, doesn't work. A lot of what persuasion has been talked about is like something having to do with this word charisma, right? Like people have charisma, this kind of magnetism.
But what's interesting to think about is the root word of charisma is, the, is, is in Greek, it's that word charis, which means actually grace, as in grace under pressure. And I think that's a very interesting insight into what charisma is all about. I would also say that persuasive people have a lot of confidence, they seem to, and not just job confidence. Job confidence is easy. Self-confidence is hard, harder. Job con and we all, I'm the same way, we're all that way, that's a shared value. Lack of confidence in ourselves. Remember, and here's the tip, others see you completely differently than you see yourself. And generally people want you to succeed, I believe. That's another, I think, very important quality of persuasion is, the, is that you feel comfortable in your own skin, and that can be hard, but also, more importantly, that you have the ability to make others feel comfortable, no matter who. And as I never met him, but I was told by friends who did meet him that President Clinton, and when he was at his peak, he had this quality, just he was incredible at that. The ability to make others feel comfortable despite his position as president. And this is another thing I think persuasive people have, is they ha seem to have a goal or a purpose or a mission. They might be rather driven, okay? But they're very, you know, they, they want to go forward with this. But all of those things I don't think add up to persuasion. I frankly think that the, 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 the decisive factor is this. It's the willingness to take risks. And I don't mean risky behavior, I don't mean that. What I mean is the willingness to be open, to be human, to be vulnerable, to be approachable, to be willing to say, I made a mistake, despite the depth of experience and your level of expertise. That, I think, is very persuasive and disarming for people who want to oppose you or people who disagree or just don't want to listen. Those were just politicians, obviously, and then, you know, pick your own, pick your own types. Now, very briefly, I want to talk about this as long as we're on the subject of persuasion, and that's this silly thing, body language. A lot has been written about this, and I don't believe any of it. And that's just me. But I just don't believe that stuff. In my opinion, when, there, when it comes to expressing ideas effectively, there's only one thing you want to know about body language. You know what it is? That's it. That's it. I wouldn't worry too much about like waving your arms or all that stuff. Too many rules. Who I, don't, I don't know. That's for me. I would, though, ask you to consider that passion and enthusiasm for your, sub for your subject is superior than technical knowledge alone. It's up to you. But I would urge you to consider that. Also consider, and I think this is interesting biologically, physically, there's a physical component to body language. Body language is a mirror. And the person you're, you're with tends to reflect your body language. It comes from you first. So consider that. That body language is a mirror. Now, eye contact is important, and, and, and eye contact shows your commitment, all right, that you believe it. That doesn't mean that the, that the other person will believe you. It doesn't mean that. But it does show that you're committed to your ideas. And again, I recommend conveying your openness and humanity. Don't be so pompous. Don't be so stuck up. It's not just my Americanness either, you know what I'm saying? Because people are very, it's very mysterious how that all works, but I, I'm in favor of that. By the way, science, it tends to be rather humanistic anyway, so you're just fulfilling a stereotype. Um, clothing and appearance, yeah, well, when you talk, match your clothing to the occasion, keep it conservative and simple, I recommend. Check your hair before start. There's nothing worse than, yes, I want to give you this important point, and you know, <laughs> right, it's really, it's quality. Details count, by the way, and here's a good example. Do you know what that is? <laughs> this was the president of the World Bank when he appeared at the Hagia Sophia in the mosque in Istanbul and had to take off his shoes going in. Yeah, Paul Wolfowitz at that time. It's a and that was the headline that day, not his visit. It was that. Yeah, so just pay attention. Your mom told you this anyway. Oh, God, it's disgusting. Anyway, your appearance should not draw attention away from your message. That's the only thing. That's why I say go cons more conservative. Now, some people simply will not be persuaded. And that's a, that can be accepted, of course. We don't all have to agree, right? Absolutely. Remember the old line or the old thinking that other people have brains too? <laughs> you know that one? I've had trouble with that. 
Other people have brains too, they do, it must be respected. But others, I would say, have a very different idea, and that is, these are the people who are skeptical, even cynical about what you are doing, and to get to the point where they want to oppose what you are doing at any cost, for whatever agenda they may have, whether it's true or not. So here are some tips for responding to that, and my, my, my main comment, and I'm happy to talk about this more in detail, is you've got to give it back to them like they give it to you. <laughs> Don't go, well, I'm above that. That, pl that plays into their worst instincts. Don't do that. Give it back to them just the way they gave it to you. For example, if they say to you, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Valerio, you know what the answer is? Actually, I do know what I'm talking about. Just like that. Just give it right back to them and don't just put up, don't put up with that crap. You know, I'm talking about a certain kind of skeptic. Follow what I'm saying. Specifics work, numbers work, not generalities. Without this, we wouldn't have, we took these steps and this was result. I saw this in another place under the regulations we're now required to. Specifics are important and as scientists, obviously you're good at that, just choose the right ones. Here's another good one. Provide your CV, <laughs> absolutely. Tell them why you are qualified to speak on this. Tell them what you have done specifically. Tell them what you have seen others do. That is persuasive. It's more than they've done, I'll guarantee you that. And this can also be very persuasive, the, com the combination of humor and self-assurance, if you're, if you're up to it. That can also be very disarming and very persuasive, if you can do it. One other quick point before I go to our conclusion. This is an interesting idea, and of course this is coming rather from my, my side of the planet, so I want to throw it in though because I think it is useful. What could storytelling possibly have to do with science? That is a, you know, obviously nothing, right? But first let me ask you the question, what are the three parts of a story? What are they? What are the three parts of a story? What are the three parts of a story? Sorry. Beginning, what else? Middle and end, remember that? Yeah. This is narrative structure, character conflict resolution. Well, that is a shared value, by the way. That's very, very deep. Yeah, you're thinking too hard. See, that's it. That's very, very deep in society, not only in Western culture, but in world cult culture. And um, that's a very, very, and we know in the television business, that's a very efficient way for expressing complex ideas. That works because audiences like that. That works. Now, I'm not talking that your, your paper shouldn't be like that and nothing like that, but possibly within a presentation you could use this. But here's what I mean by that. Keep in mind, just as an open mind, that stories are never about big issues like cancer or diabetes or heart disease, never. Never. They are always about how ordinary people are affected by big issues. See the difference? And that's quite resonant for audiences. So if you would like to find a little story to tell in your presentation or in your discussion or in your discussion with donors, don't ask what the story is about, ask who the story is about. And I'll tell you, for the general public, what makes a compelling story for them? Humanity and human emotion, something that is new, unusual, or breaks stereotypes, an unforgettable image, sound, or moment, something that touches their lives directly, and this, stories and storytelling. Ordinary people affected by big issues, ordinary people reacting to extraordinary situations, something that makes the audience ask, what if it was me? Why is it we have to look at a car accident? Why is it when we're driving past, we just have to look? Why is it? Because we all know what it's like to be in a car. Why did September 11th have such tremendous impact around the world other than the crime itself? Because I think most people know what it's like to be in a jetliner and everyone knows what it's like to go to the office and when you bring those two things together, what if it was me? That's what I mean. And I would comment that science is rich in all of these. Mm. 
So again, remember, it's not what the story is about, it's who it's about. Who has the most at stake? Who has the most to lose? All right? Just as a comment. Now, some challenges for the scientific community. First of all, how are we expressing what we do? Many, not all, but many institutions have a defensive, not an open posture. Many scientists, no one in this room, no one in this room, I might add, but many scientists use jargon and are simply inaccessible. I'm above this. The humanism, the human cost aspect is often missing in your explanation of your work. Risks versus benefits are often not explained clearly. And often the relevance is not explained clearly. Who is expressing what we do? How many scientists are public figures? Why? Why? Because the culture of science doesn't reward that. Public outreach does not contribute to promotion, salary increases, tenure, or recognition within the profession or scientific disciplines. It just doesn't. Now. Now it doesn't. Maybe that's changing. Should public outreach be counted as an important positive element of top professional behavior in science? Paul Ehrlich of Stanford believes that all scientists who are at that very top level, the top level, should tithe 10% of their time to this every year. Can we identify people who have that talent? Some people don't want to do that, and who can blame them? But the people who do, should we develop them? Should we develop that talent? And by the way, why should we talk to the public at all? Well, Berndt touched it on a couple of them, I think. Money. Johnny too, that is as in support for your work. Help shape the regulatory climate, don't be a victim of it. I think you have a duty to report the fruits of your work, especially if it's funded with public money. People want to know, share. And I think also why you should talk to the public is you should recruit young people by communicating the excitement of science to them. Well, that's it. Thank you very much.